Ramda school, this elusive school with all of these terrible things happening to it and where Andre Rond was working. Now, by this time, Andre Rond was already, he had already served 10 months in prison for the abduction of several children from a local YMCA. None of the children were uh, harmed, but he had no consent from any parents or guardians. And uh, in the uh, in the documentary where I get a lot of my information from, which if you haven't seen it, it's really good. Uh, they actually talk to one of the children that was abducted that day. And he was like, we had no, we had no clue what was going on. It was just like, yeah, here we go. We're going on a field trip. Uh, so yeah, the kids were unarmed, but in July 15th, or on July 15th, 1981, Holly Ann Hughes, um, who was seven at the time, went missing. And several eyewitnesses later would claim that um, she had been seen with Andre Rond in a vehicle. Now, Tanya Goodson recalled in the Cropsey documentary seeing Rond pull her into his car. In 1983, TAEC, or TAAC Jackson disappeared after uh, she went to the store for some food. She was 11 years old. And again, eyewitnesses were able to place her with Andre Rond. In 1984, Hank Gaffario also went missing. He was uh, 24, 20, 21. He was in his 20s. And uh, eyewitnesses reported seeing him with Rond as well. Now, Hank Gaffario had disabilities. And, um, in the Cropsey documentary, people that, uh, in the town that remembered him or recalled seeing him, they were like, um, he was a distinctive looking kid. He looked like Mick Jagger. And this was the only case that kind of stepped away from his MO in a sense because there was a pattern happening here. Young women, July... July was huge. Everybody was in July, um, except for around this time with uh, Hank. Then on July 9th, sorry, <laughs> then on July 9th, 1987, a 12-year-old girl was reported missing, Jennifer Schweiger. Now Jennifer had Down syndrome, so this kind of links into the um, demo again, July, but also um, with Hank, with the uh, young people with disabilities. After 35 days of searching for her body, um, she was found in a shallow grave on the Willowbrook School property which now had been shut down. So at this time, when Jennifer Schweiger's body was found, Andre Rond was charged for the kidnapping and the murder of Jennifer. He was arrested, again, he was arrested prior to the body being found. Um, he had lied to reporters about knowing her, and uh, he changed his story several times. But many do believe that the body might have been planted by the real killer or that Andre Rond was not working alone. Now, the jury could not reach a verdict about her murder or death, but they did convict him of kidnapping and he 
thanks directed to the ladies on Staten Island um, who supported prosecutional indictiveness against an innocent person.
it's very, it's just a bizarre, it's a bizarre case, it's a bizarre documentary, and it really looks into kind of like our minds and the um, oral storytelling of our culture, many cultures, and how that's what that does. So, again, his burp walk, um, he is drooling, he is not there, he is a mess, and uh, somebody had said in the documentary that evilness sells, and in this way that burp walk kind of sold, it sold and sealed and signed and delivered a tragedy. saying that D is not guilty, not saying, not saying any of that, um, but did he get a fair shake in his trial? Um, I don't know, I don't know, and I think it, I think that's kind of what the documentary had been seeking out to do, to kind of ask those questions, like, um, more critically about that. And some believed he was framed, completely framed. Some believe that he was uh, a martyr for the cause. They needed to put somebody in prison for kidnapping little girls, kidnapping children with disabilities, and they needed to do it. There was a lot of societal social pressure. And one look at Andre Ron, and they were like, oh, there he is. So that's what some people believe. Again, these are, this is research, this is not my own, this is research, this is watching the documentary. Ron did deny and deny and deny to be interviewed in, sorry, Ron did deny to be interviewed in the documentary and then finally when he agreed to it. The filmmakers did show up to meet with him, but he did not want to meet with them. And he does this frequently, or he done this frequently. I'm not sure exactly um, what his life is like today. But yeah, they were so close to speaking with him.
ASMR. Bye.